Susan, first question, for the benefit of those who might not know, even though it's a, a classic story, what is the story of, of this Doolittle? Um, our version of Doolittle, uh, we kind of harken back to the source material, which is the books. Mm. And ours picks up when John Doolittle's wife has passed several years before. Mm. And he's become essentially a hermit, living in his manor with all of the animals, but having no interest in the outside world, no interest in other humans. And on one particular day, two things happen. A young boy accidentally injures a squirrel hunting with his family, which he feels awful about. And he's heard of the elusive, you know, Dr. Doolittle, and he decides to come and see if he can help him with the squirrel. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the queen has fallen gravely ill and has sent a young girl to fetch Doolittle, because it's the only person she trusts who can come and help her and figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. And both those kids descend on Doolittle that day. And the animals are kind of excited by this intrusion and the mm -hmm. idea that they might get to get him out of the house and back dealing with people again. So they sort of push him into accepting the uh, request to go see the queen, hmm. which he does. He sort of figures out what needs to be done to help her, and that's what sets off this adventure with Doolittle and the animals. And the young boy stows away initially, and he ends up joining. And it is hmm. really the kind of Doolittle coming back to the world again, and, um, and this very unconventional family coming together. Uh, you as, as Team Downey have been quite choosy about the projects you do, especially yeah. independently. So with Doolittle, was there something particular that appealed to you? I know you, the two of you have a lot of animals at home anyway, but was there something <laughs> about this that really st sort of sprang out to you? Yeah, we do. We have sort of a ridiculous menagerie of animals at the house. We are animal lovers, and I think the idea of being able to talk to animals is a wonderful fantasy. Um, the opportunity was, uh, there were a few things, I think from um, the standpoint of being able to do a family film, we hadn't done that before. Uh, you know, even the Marvel films our seven-year-old couldn't see. And so this is the first time we set out to do something that a whole family can, can look at and go see and enjoy together. Um, the themes of the movie were really, I think, messages that we need today. You know, very uplifting. It's about communication. It's about finding and embracing a family. And, um, I think in general it's just uh, all about how if we just listen to each other, uh, the world can be a better place. And then there was a sort of degree of technical difficulty in sort of laying this animated movie over a, which is essentially even though they're photorealistic, they're, you know, animation over live action. And even with all of the visual effects we've done in Sherlock and all that, it was never to this degree. Mm. So it was, you know, for us to take on a project, it has to tick a few different boxes. Mm. Um, obviously, there are a lot of animals in the movie, but in in the books, there are there are still others who who sort of populate Doolittle's world. Yeah. Was there anybody that you couldn't get in that maybe you hope they get in? I know he has a, a pig for a friend as well in, in in the books. Was there anyone you couldn't quite squeeze in that maybe you might think about if if there's a chance? Well, the books are an incredible resource to go back to, and. Um, sure, I think we can look to see, but what we wanted to do was figure out what journeys we wanted these animals to go on, mm -hmm. and then kind of Steve Gagan, who wrote the draft that we we went off and made with him, um, he really picked the ones that he wanted to bring to life, mm -hmm. and uh, kind of figured out the personalities and why they there, were there with Doolittle. Some of them had physical reasons, some of them had emotional reasons, but we wanted to understand why they, they were all with him at the manor and then understand what this journey was going to bring out in each of them and you know where they were going to go by the end. So yeah, if we get the opportunity again, then why not go back to you know the great source material? For you, there are, there are these great animal personalities, these little character stories that fold into it. Is there a personal favorite for you? Is there one animal that, that you can sort of pick out that you really enjoyed? unlike live action, much more like an animated movie, you can continue to go back and kind of tweak things with the voice talent. We mm -hmm. were so fortunate to have such talented people mm -hmm. um, that like, like a kid, you're never gonna pick your favorite, yeah. um, but you got to see each of them kind of come to life at different times in the process. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I will say at the end, it was just delightful to see them all and to see it really working and, and each of them finding their moment when we started and we were looking at these animals, our goal was to have 
each one of them have some sort of either arc or win, mm -hmm. some moment where you were like, you go, you know, and mm -hmm. I think that we, we accomplished that. Um, obviously, you have you have the animals who are a huge appeal of the film, but you also have the human characters who are very important too. Mm -hmm. How did you go up about finding sort of uh, the two the two kids who who interact with Robert the most probably and and help drive his story along at the same time? Was that a big search and and how did you come about the two that you eventually chose? Yeah, it was a big search to find the kids. I mean, we were very very fortunate. Um, with the other talent, whether it was Michael Sheen or Jim Broadbent, that, and even the voice talent, that mm -hmm. kind of who we wanted, we got. Mm -hmm. But these kids, you know, you, you cast a wide net. And we had um, an incredible casting person, Lucy Bevan, who mm -hmm. is really talented. And she, she did cast that wide net and then started showing us people. And it got down with Stubbins' character um, to two boys that we had uh, actually fly to Atlanta where Robert was doing one of the Avengers things mm -hmm. and um, they did screen tests with him and Harry just shined. You know, he brought all of that curiosity um, and warmth that was needed in Stubbins because he was on a bit of a hard journey starting in a place where you wanted to feel badly for him and mm -hmm. Doolittle isn't particularly welcoming at the beginning, so, um, but you needed to believe that he had kind of that, that spunk to want to keep going mm -hmm. um, and engage with the animals, engage with Doolittle, and, and Harry just, like, there's just this incredible, uh, other than just being very talented, there's just this twinkle in his eye. And then with Lady Rose, that one was interesting because I remember looking at all the people, again, this is after Lucy's gone through her thing, and Carmel just stood out. Like, I never, like, thought of anyone else. Once I saw her, she was Lady Rose. And she is just so delightful and talented. And they're just both good kids, hmm. you know? It's like you, you always get warned about working with kids and all that, and you never know what you're going to get or what you're going to get with the parents or whatever, yeah. or, or the tutor or whoever's going to maybe cause some problems. But we were mm -hmm. so fortunate, and they were just so happy to be part of it and just sponges to everything going on around. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was really nice. 